Are you actually marching in this um, big boy or? Yeah, I kind of caught up with it. You kind of caught up with it? <laughs> <laughs> like a lot of people in Hamilton, I think they yeah. sort of, it, oh, give me sort of your overview of, of this whole asset sale damaging the environment through things like the fracking and, and, and all this sort of thing. And, and um, basically, I'm, I can't see you thinking there's anything good with it, so basically, what do you think's wrong with it? <laughs> Just to educate a few people that might might watch this about why there's all these people are making a bit of a fuss about it. I, I think there's, there's like when you look at the specific issues, there's a whole lot of different reasons why each specific issue is specifically a bad idea. Yeah. So if you take the asset sales for example, it's hard to see what the benefit is going to be for New Zealand because we're selling off large chunks of our assets and in order the government says to pay off debt. The cost of the debt is less than the you know than the return that we're going to get. So what it means is by we actually lose economically by selling assets to pay off debt. Yeah. We'd be you know because of the rate of return we'd be better to just keep the debt and use the the income from the asset to pay off the debt. We'll so actually be in a better position. From a business point of view you're using a similar like the analogy would be um, Selling your, be your your business to pay off the phone bill instead yeah. of keeping in business and making the money to pay off exactly. the phone bill. Yeah, exactly. And paying a little exactly. bit of interest in the in the process. Exactly. Yeah. So so economically, asset sales are a really bad idea. Yeah. Um, in addition, what they do is because they're strategically important national assets, what they do is they start to locate control outside of the community and the nation, and they start to put the control into the hands of simple yep. shareholders, you yep. know, who could be, and the government says, oh, they'll be sold to New Zealanders, but inevitably they're going to end off being held and, offshore. And even though, like, it won't, like, what's sold won't be controlling the shareholding, as shareholders you actually have legally enforceable rights. So if the government makes strategic decisions around moving into renewables, there's a, there's a potential for that to be challenged in court by even minority shareholders. Yeah. So, you know, so there's, there's a whole load of reasons why um, selling off chunks of our, of, of our power generation companies is going to, I think, make it more difficult for us to move into the way we've got to go, which is to move into renewables yeah. away from coal and away from fossil yeah. fuels. I looked at myself from the point of view of um, someone in, say, America doesn't have the same concern about social impact of decisions for a, what's now state-owned enterprise as someone who lives in New Zealand, because we're aware of the social impact of, say, raising yeah. the price of power yeah. um, that an American wouldn't have a clue about, and wouldn't. why would they be concerned about it anyway, if, right. even if they did have a clue? That's right. And legally, the, the company has an obligation to maximise the benefit for its shareholders. That's, you yeah. know, the, this has been tested in court numerous times, and so, it, you know, um, you know, so, it, so it put, it's going to put the company in a position of conflict between exactly those kind of the, the, the social outcomes and simply maxi maximising yeah. return, which the government's already putting pressure on them in any case, but it's just going to make that much worse. Yeah. So I, I, the other thing I've, I've always been a bit stumped about is my father and mother and grandparents have paid for these assets um, through their taxes and things in the past. Yeah. So. How does that not count as being a shareholder, in a manner of speaking, yeah. in these assets, yeah. yet um, not getting permission of those shareholders to sell the assets? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, what they're really doing, you know, like, the government's got this whole mining mentality. We're strip mining the country, you know, so, and, and say, selling assets, to me, it's like mining out the social capital because it's it's the community effort that's built these national assets. Yeah. It's our collective wealth that's gone to build them and put them in place. And now it's like mining it out and uh, you know in order to just like get short term profit or short you know yeah. just a short term capital in influx. But we lose we're losing in the long term. And the same you know the thing is, is like that's just one issue. So we've also got the oil drilling, um, which is the same kind of issue. Is is deep sea? We're prospecting for deep sea oil. Um, in this country right now, yeah. um, well, you know, we're, we're letting it up. We're, let, we're putting it open for overseas companies to prospect for oil in, in the deep sea areas, deep sea basins. Incredibly dangerous and difficult areas to, to drill, as we've seen. I mean, more dangerous than the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. Uh, you know, deep. But the same deep problems wells. as the Gulf of Mexico. So, do, you you know, think, so do you think the, the, the money and effort would be better spent in, in alternatives? Because 
Well, we all know that oil's going to run out someday, so yeah. eventually you're going to squeeze the earth dry. Yeah. Yeah. So wouldn't it be better to, yeah. to, to, to put that into other alternatives now rather than waiting until we've got a big oil slick off the coast yeah. of New Zealand yeah. and, and run out of oil and gone, oh, OK, we've got to come up with something else. Oh, hang on, we've got no fish in the ocean because they've all died from the oil slick. Yeah. You know? And it's, it's actually the fact that we're running out of cheap oil is what is driving this kind of thing because it's like... Uh, because we're, our Western civilization is, or industrial civilization, is so um, is so addicted to fossil fuels that it's getting more and more expensive. We're getting to the end of the cheap stuff. It's, oil wells are starting to peak and decline in production, and so this is driving this move to start looking for oil in more and more difficult, expensive places. It's, it's that, that concept that as the value goes up, yeah. it justifies the increased yeah. risk. So now they're talking about drilling in Antarctica, you've got the stuff with the tar sands and the shale oil, you know, terribly environmentally destructive stuff going on, but it's all driven by this refusal to actually wake up and go, OK, we're running out of cheap oil, we need to start looking at alternative energy sources. And in fact, the whole thing, if, you, you know, if, you're, if you're using non-renewable energy, yeah. You have to be putting that energy into finding renewable alternatives. If you don't... You're you know, wasting the energy. Yeah you're, just, yeah, you're having a party and you're pissing up against the wall. You know, yeah. if you're not actually investing it in finding a renewable alternative, and that's what we haven't been doing. And in a way, if the government was to say, well, we want to do some of this drilling, but and, and actually we're going to invest the, the profit into a serious sustainability plan, Voltaire or, yeah, I might actually be then prepared to go, hang on, well, let's actually have a look at what you're, what you're talking about. Yeah. But they're not even going to do that. You know, they're talking about, again, a, flick, a quick flush of money. It's going to go through. It's going to be gone in a few years, and we're going to be back in the same position. And this is the whole thing, the government's agenda. is like It's all about getting these little bursts of money, and then at the end, when the money dries up, we're what no happens. better off because they're not actually investing in sustainable infrastructure yeah. and the kinds of things that we need as a nation to move into the It, it almost century. looks like it's, OK, we're in power now. Um, we'll do this all now, use it up, because we know at some point we're going to lose an election and then we can say it's the other party's problem yeah. and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. You know, and would it be safe to say that you're not just looking at this from a, a, a Greenpeace greeny angle, there's also the, the sheer business sense involved in this. Oh, it's in, in terms of the strategic, you know, strategic planning for New Zealand, yeah. there is none. I mean, and this is the problem with the, with the kind of agenda that the government's running. It doesn't believe in strategic planning, yeah. really. Uh, that's for the market. Well, the market doesn't do strategic yeah. planning. The market's reactive. You know, that, that's actually what you need. That's what politics is for. Yeah. Good politics, real politics, not the kind of stuff we usually practice, but but um, real leadership and, and real political activity should be about strategic planning and putting in place the framework so that we can move forward in a prosperous and positive way. So that's like investing in sustainable infrastructure because we know that we're coming to the end of cheap oil. We know that climate change is starting to happen and it's going to get worse. We know that we are coming to the, you know, the end of the line on a lot of resources. We're reaching the resource limits of the planet. And if we don't actually start to address that and start to plan how we're going to deal with that, then we're going to, you know, we're going to crash. Yeah. We're so we're going to wake up one morning and find we're sitting in a big sand pit. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and, and, that's, and that's the important thing about a hickory like this is because there's all these different agendas and they're all, they've all got specific reasons why they're really stupid. I mean, we can talk about lignite. You know, they're talking about coal to urea and all this yeah. kind of stuff and, and and the whole you know opening up the conservation state for gold and silver. Like there's a whole load of really stupid ideas that the government's <laughs> pursuing right now. But I think what's important about a hickory like this is it draws all those things together and says it's not what they're not separate issues. They're they part of one together. basic agenda, and the you know and you've really got a choice. It's like, is it money or is it life and, and real prosperity, will be real yeah. well-being? That's really the you know See, what's on the that's balance. That's the one thing that I've looked at and seen that's missing is this concept of looking at people and society as a form of, of, of wealth that needs to be looked yeah, after yeah, yeah. and the fact that well basically anyone who studied biology knows that you look at the animals that are on the earth or in the ocean and if they're getting sick there's something wrong with the ocean so yeah, that's if, right. if fish are dying there's something wrong with the ocean yeah. so therefore it goes the other way if you dump poison into the ocean you're going to kill the fish yeah. so if, if you poison the land or that, those sorts of things yeah. you're going to kill off well us yeah. 
It's because they're still locked into a way of thinking that's that's historical. They're still locked into reductionist thinking, you know, which is you understand reality by chopping up into pieces. Yeah, they're very very invasive sort of theory. Yeah. Whereas, whereas if you look at uh, where um, where science is really going now, it's, it actually is increasingly understanding things as systems and understanding that things are connected an intrinsic level. You yeah. Know, and that's really. You know, the, in the, over this century, that's the kind of mentality that, as a, all around the world, we have to really get that at a deep level, that we are all intrinsically connected with each other as people, yeah. with the rest of life, with the whole universe in fact, but particularly with this earth that we are, you know, we're, we're made from. You yeah. Know, See, we I've, have to I've, understand that. I've, I've found that, unfortunately, we're being taught that um, money is the most important thing and the, the, the status or type of job you have yeah. and the amount of money you earn is the most important thing in the world yeah. rather than how you interact with yeah, people, right. how you um, look after dealing with your, 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 your thing, your basic things like yeah. your rubbish yeah. um, and, and all those sorts of yeah. things yeah. in particular the pe people to people yeah. um, interaction is That's not weird. considered valuable or important. Yeah. So you could be the poorest person in the world uh, but be the nicest, yeah. most caring person in the world, and you have nowhere near the same value as the most nasty rich person in the world. Yeah, that's right. And, and the thing is, I mean, yes, inc wealth does, material wealth does increase happiness up to a certain level. Like if you're starving and you don't, have, or you don't have decent housing and those kinds of things, yes, uh, you know, raising your level of, of material well-being does Make increase your general happy, yeah. happiness. But it's only up to a certain level. Yeah. In, in places like New Zealand and America and Western Europe, we reached that stage in about the 60s. Yeah. So, and if you, you actually, you know, you look at the studies on happiness, all the material wealth increased since that time hasn't increased our general happiness. So yeah. you, then you've got to start to go, well, what is it that makes us happy? What is it that makes life better? And it's, as you say, it's relationships with the people around us, it's our family, it's, it's um, a sense of inclusiveness and belonging in our community, it's living in a, in a beautiful place and having a relationship with the environment yeah. around you. It's all those really basic things. And being able to sit and have discussions like this with someone and go, yeah. OK, I've enjoyed that discussion, yeah. Yeah. That, was, that was enjoyable. Yeah. And we didn't need to make money out of it. Yeah, and we, we didn't, did, need to we didn't have to posture and yeah. we didn't have to go, oh, oh you're this status, I'm this yeah, status right. and all that's that right. sort of thing. That's so, that, yeah, that's, but, and that's, the thing that worries me about this, the, the agenda that the government's pursuing is that it's, it's, the agenda the government's pursuing is, is completely against that notion because it's about transferring everything into money, transfer our, our beautiful environment into money, yeah. transfer our, our social capital into money. It's, like every, it's just monetizing I, I, everything. And, um, and, and I think what's, hap what's happening to the government is the mask is like coming off and people are really starting to see what the real agenda of national is underneath that lovely smile, <laughs> you know. And, and um, I, my, my view is that the national government is going, OK, because they're not even trying to convince people, they're just going hard. I think they've gone, we're unlikely to get another term. If we do, that's great, but... We just, you know, I think their agenda is to get everything done as fast as they they'll, can. They'll burn the crops once you've invaded an area, burn the crops before you leave well, so the locals starve. The thing is, even <laughs> if they voted out at the next election, once the mines are in, it's going to be much more difficult to yeah. take them out. Once the assets are sold, you can't get them back. You know, so they're, all these things are like irreversible, and I think they're just trying to do as much irreversible stuff as they can before we kick them out. And that's why I think one of the strategic things has got to be we have to delay their as agenda. As long as possible. And as long as possible. Because I've noticed they've done that in the past. And not to say that, Nash, that Labour's going to be a whole lot better necessarily, but but I think there's the potential for coalition yeah. that's much more interesting. I also think that if, if Labour sees how National's been um, um, treated on these issues, yeah, Labour right. would theoretically have common sense not to step yeah. into that arena yeah. in, in, in a negative way. They should sit back and learn, OK, yeah. um, National's got a got a bit of an ass kicking from the public yeah. on on in this area. Yeah. If if we, because they're focused on staying in power, each yeah. government, you know, right. each, right. each party. So if yeah. we want to stay in in, in government, yeah. we've actually got to listen to the people, yeah. work with them, work in coalition yeah. with other parties. Yeah. But it, I mean, that's right. No, you're quite right. But in addition, what I'd like to see is people strengthen. Uh, people strengthen the small parties because it's the small yeah. parties and particularly like Greens, Mana, um, you know, even, even New Zealand First. I mean I'm not a New Zealand First supporter but on some of these issues you know so it's, it's like... They're giving power back to the people more 
Um, it's, it's like the power has gone away from people. It, it, yeah. it takes an event like this Hikoi yeah. to to give people some some sort of power to just yeah. to, to, to speak out. Yeah. And it's missing in in the decision making process. Like it's um, it, it, if you're going to sell the assets, it's you should be listening to whether yeah, the people want right, it or not. Right. And if the people don't want it, right. they go, well, okay, we don't. Rather than going, people don't want it, okay, we'll um, anyway, how do we ignore that and that's just right. keep on going anyway? Because they don't have a mandate. The government no. does not have a mandate for these actions. Uh, so, do you think, I, I know you've pretty much already answered this in a way, but do you think things like this, people getting out and actually speaking their mind, are going to have an effect? On its own, doing a march or hikoi on its own isn't going to change the government's mind. But as part of a broader campaign, yes. And I think what this is about is, is first of all, letting, letting us know there's lots of us who don't agree with this agenda. And then secondly, it's a, it's a stepping stone. It's a way of engaging with yeah. the public and talking to people. And because it's that building that corridor and, the, and the, the common kind of understanding of what's going on and what we can do about it, and then that moving into further action. You say that it is beneficial or good for people to get out and speak their mind on these issues and, and write to their politicians, um, get out and, and, and actually voice their opinion on an issue, yeah. um, like, like what the issues that have been covered here, so that the rest of the country, and in particular the politicians, are fully aware yeah. of not just what they as an individual, but how many people object to this. Yeah. Because a lot of people seem to think that their opinion doesn't really matter and yeah. forget that if if three million people came out and said, no, take your asset sales and put them where the sun don't shine, someone's got to take notice of that. Yeah. Look, for a politician, if you just talk to your friends, your opinion doesn't matter. They just assume you agree with them. You have to get on the streets, you have to get in their face, you have to get into their office, you have to write them letters, emails, you got to be at the committees, all that stuff. Whatever you can do, as much of it as you feel you can do, you have to make your voice known because otherwise they're just going to plough right over the top of you.